have at their disposition to pay Maine Horse Establishment for the services of Patrick Moraz. Did you write that? Yes. It has been written like that, yes. And below, there's a number 501,150. And you wrote, quote, bring that up so we can see it. It's steady. Quote, more than half a million U.S. dollars to be shared between the four actual members of the Moody Blues, Justin, yeah. Hay Justin Hayward, John Lodge, Graham Edge, and Ray Thomas, out of which amount they will have to pay their own company threshold. Did you write that? Yes. Now, on the next page, at the very top, it says, Main Horse Establishment has been paid so far for 23 days at $800 a day. Right. The Main Horse Establishment, that's that company in Liechtenstein that you were talking about, correct? Yes. And that was for work that you did on the current album, is that correct? Yes. What album was that? Was uh, that it was called The Other Side of Life. Thank you. Now, on the next page, I call your attention to the bottom, very bottom paragraph. It says, although having been with the band for well over seven years mm -hmm. and having been asked to be equal sharing in the touring expenses and proceeds, Patrick Moraz is still treated as a non-equal member in all respects. Was that correct? At that point it was, yeah, that's what I felt, yeah. Uh -huh. And you remember you also testified that when the band came to you and said, we want you to be treated as an equal member on the touring, it was because they felt that was the only economical way to do it, otherwise they were going to lose money. Remember you testified that? Yes. Now let's go on to page five or six or whatever and let the jury take a look. I'm not going to ask a question on this, but since there's not that many pages, let's just put it up so we have an idea what's going on. If you'll excuse me just the time pressure, I'm going to take that down. Put, pull it down and we'll have to let him read it some other way. Let's go up to the next page. There's still a couple pages. Next page. No, not that one. No, that, that's out of order. That's the last page. The last page comes first. It's out of order. Now, here's a page that says in the big paragraph in the middle, is that was obviously a typographical error you made. We're going to take a break for just a few moments. When we come back, we'll bring you back into this courtroom as Don Engel continues to question Patrick Moraz about a number of documents, including letters he himself had sent to the other members of the Moody Blues Band. We're back in just a few moments, so stay with us. Do your kids like to read? Nicholas like to read? No. My kids hate to read. Unless it's a toy catalog. Now here's a page that says in the big paragraph in the middle, is, that was obviously a typographical error you made, it has to be understood and forwarded that, although certain payments have already been made to Main Horse Establishment for the services of Patrick Moraz. None of the music and sounds so far already recorded in the context of the new album by Patrick Moraz are usable for release in the context of the said album until a satisfactory agreement has been reached. All rights remain reserved at this stage. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So it was your position at that time until you had a written contract for this album even though they had paid you for the 23 days, they could not use your material. Is that correct? Was that That's correct. Okay. Now let's go on to that last page. Now you notice at the bottom... But that's not the last page. The last page was the one we read before. 
Well, this takes us conclusion. No, I'm sorry, sir. Well, I'm well, sorry. No, it's, it's, uh, yeah. It is apparently misplaced in, in the various binders. It says conclusion. The next line says in view of the circumstances. You have it, you have it there, Mr. Morales. You it, see it? Yes, I, I've seen that's it. Fine. That's fine. That's the one that we're talking about. It's the correct way because if you look to the page before, you'll see the sentence continue. I wrote the letter, remember? Well, your sentence continued on the this page. Believe me, it's the correct way. The conclusion was at the end. At the bottom of the page with the conclusion, you wrote, as for the so-called imbalance having arisen by reason of poor sales of the present. You see that? It may be out of order in the book, but just Excuse look at the conclusion page. All that we're talking, Mr. Brands, all we're talking about, don't worry about the proper order of the pages. Let's just focus upon the page that yes, okay. reads conclusion at the very top. You say that the imbalance on the present can't and won't be taken into consideration due to the fact that neither the four members nor the producer of the present have taken my various comments into consideration and even refused to listen to some of the tracks I had been preparing for that particular album. So you were disturbed because none of your tracks were on that album, is that correct? Uh, no, I was talking about the present album. Uh... On the present album, right. The previous album. Oh, yeah. You were disturbed about it. Yes, I was disturbed, yeah. yes. And the album didn't do well, and the Moody Blues said to you, look, you, you made more money than we did because we haven't earned any money on that album. And you yes. refused to make an adjustment, isn't that correct? That's right. <clears throat> then you went up further. You said, probably the record company, having not promoted the album as well as they should, is a major reason for the failure of that album. I can't be penalized for such third-party negligence. Now, you contend you were a full member of the Moody Blues at this time. Uh, did you think the Moody Blues was supposed to be penalized for the negligence of the record company, but you shouldn't? Um, I've never referred to the Moody Blues there. I referred to, uh, uh, to me. I, I said I can't be penalized for third-party negligence. Nothing to do there. I, I, I didn't mention them, so the, the question didn't arise then. It didn't arise. Well, you knew that if the record company didn't sell records, the Moody Blues weren't getting any royalties either. Did yeah, well, they wrote the music, and I proposed to write some before. You know. I see. If you wrote it, it would have done better, even if the record I'm sure company didn't it would have done much better, because as a group, we could have worked as a unit and really uh, developed our forces where the sum of the parts are greater than the parts. You've had about six or seven groups that you work with, haven't you? No, I've had uh, a couple of groups under my own name, and then I've had um, I've been invited to join uh, another band before Yes called Refugee. Then I went to Yes, and then the Moody Blues. What do you mean you were invited to join Refugee? You were in Refugee, weren't you? I was in Refugee. That was That's there. what I said. Yeah, I was invited to form Refugee. I'm not interested in whether you're invited. Why don't you answer the question? I, was I counted invited. when you were testifying. I, I, I was invited to form Refugee with the two ex-members of right. the night. How many bands were you in? Um, counting my own bands? Yes. I've been into the Patrick Murray. Just how many? How many? How One, many? two, three, five, six, including the Moody Blues. Have you ever written a hit album? Um, if I yes, of course. I have written a, a hit album, yes. Then why did you answer that question with one word at your deposition? No. <laughs> ah, because I was referring to the artistic content of the album, not the marketing aspect of it. So you led us to believe that we could come into court and rely on your testimony, and we asked you, did you ever re hit it, write a hit album? You said no. And we were supposed to figure out that you were referring to something different than we were referring to. Is that your testimony? It calls for speculation. Hang on. I don't think it's important what counsel is. It's very important. Je just a minute. Objections overruled. Go ahead. Can, you, can you answer that yes or no? Oh, I can't answer by yes or no, All but right. I can that's tell fine. you. That's fine. That's fine. However, I'd like that, to... That's, that's okay. fine. Mr. Raz, would you like to have a dictionary while I'm questioning you so we could look up each of these words? Honestly, would you want to have a dictionary? Oh, I'm fine like that. Pardon? I'm fine like that. Thank you very much. Yet, I, I don't I, need a dictionary. Well, the problem, Mr. Mraz, is what, what are we going to... Let's go on to the next question. 
I'm afraid of it. Your Honor, of course. Yes. Yes, disregard that comment, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Well, Your Honor, may I, may I I'll let's ask go on. Let's okay. go on and uh, ask questions and have answers. Okay. <clears throat> Is it true, Mr. Mraz, that at no time were you ever accepted as an equal member of the Moody Blues during your relationship with them? That is true. We're watching again a cross-examination by defense attorney Don Engel of the plaintiff here, Patrick Moraz. That wrapped up basically the seventh day of the trial in this matter. The eighth day began much as has we showed you the beginning of the seventh day here with the attorneys once again at each other and Judge Paul Bowen once again having to step into the middle of it to take control of his courtroom before testimony begins. Let's go back in the courtroom now and watch how that eighth day began. You should enter a ruling now that one more improper act by Mr. Johnson of this type, and I'm going to specify, whether intentional, compulsory, inadvertent, result of irresistible uh, impulse or general insanity, whatever reason that he does it, will result in the granting of the motion that we, that we first made for violation of continuing violation of the court order. This would include, at the least, any statements by Mr. Johnson in the middle of my examination, any testimony by Mr. Johnson of any fact at any time, such as who wrote a document or that he has documents, any suggestion by Mr. Johnson in front of the jury that my questions on cross-examination are unfair, and any attempts by him to control the flow of evidence or documents, any gestures to the jury which indicate his belief in the truth or falsity of any matter which is unethical and improper and which he's done 50 to 200 times in this courtroom, any statements to me or my clients, and particularly when the jurors are here, or to the jury, or any statements that are heard by the jury of any nature by him. He should sit and wait till the jury walks out if he can't control himself. And any procedures, procedural matters that he brings up in front of the jury, such as asking to have his client explain things, should automatically at least result in the termination sanction. Now, in addition, we will be seeking corrective instructions related to that past behavior in some attempt to uh, ameliorate the situation. We don't think, we, we, we've decided that we feel we'd rather have them either towards the end of the trial or part of the closing. So in sum, Your Honor, I think that Mr. Johnson should be immediately ordered to produce, the one correction I'd like now is Mr. Johnson, before he finishes whatever he has to say, should produce documents showing that there was a statement that there was a 1980 agreement and an oral agreement and that they should, whatever it says, they shouldn't have written contracts, they shouldn't breach, they shouldn't, do whatever he says, because that there was are. my question. And if he doesn't do that, I think that you should instruct the jury that he made those statements, his client made those statements, and he doesn't have the documents. And secondly, I think you, sh uh, I think you should grant the motion for termination, if you don't, we should at least get a very strong conditional order. Now, may I say something, Your Honor? Every time Mr. Engel gets up, every morning, I know I'm going to get a whipping from Mr. Engel. This is a very angry man, a very angry attorney. I have said from day one, this case is about Don Engel has a personal vendetta against me for reasons I do not really understand and have never completely understood. I know that his, he is in serious trouble with his defense in this case, as evidenced by his completely pathetic cross-examination yesterday. He has not landed one blow on my client yet. That's what's happening in this case. So what you do is you pound the other lawyer. Now, I'll say I am not the world's greatest lawyer. I do not have a perfect decorum at all times, but I'm not bad, and I haven't been bad here, and you've been sitting in front of me, and you've been seeing whether or not I've been making gestures and faces to the jury. I don't look at them. I look at the screen the whole time, or else I look at my client, or I close my eyes, and that's what this whole thing is about. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Engel, let's talk about decorum. I saw a man who screamed at my client yesterday, twice, at the close of both of the examination, pulling his hair out in utter and complete frustration because 
quite frankly, he's got a guy who's telling the truth that he cannot outfox. I've got a situation here where every single day he comes in and complains about some sort of discovery problem or whatever. Take a look at who filed those ex-party applications. Every single one, with the exception of a few, were done by the Engel office. Uh, he got every document in this case as soon as possible. All of the problems I had in this case are directly related primarily to their lackadaisical attitude. He came into this case three weeks before uh, the case was ready for trial. Is not up to speed. Is not up to speed now. He's learning the case as he goes along. Um, if he had objections to make about me at any time, he should have made them at that time or had a sidebar. He didn't do it. He comes in now and he tries to chip away and, and paint me as, as often as he can as, as some ogre or terrible person. I mean, this is a hard-fought case. That's what's happening. This is a very hard-fought case. But the case is not Donald Engel against Neville Johnson. It's Patrick Moraz against the Moody Blues. Uh, now, when I said, uh, there were a couple of times when I objected, perhaps I didn't do it as artfully as, as possible, but it's saying to allow my client to explain something, hey, I don't see anything wrong with that. In terms of the declaration, I'm going to move it into evidence. If you deny it, you deny it. It was wrong for me to have said that. And there were one or two other things that were wrong. I will apologize in my closing argument and say, take no mention or need of it. Sometimes I have done things and, you know, that I, like I said, I, I'm, I'm not proud of. But I have certainly tried to do everything I can to be as as fair as possible to to the system and to and to all sides. Uh, I never. Judge Paul Boland then listening once again to another round of complaints made by the attorneys against each other. Uh, what he did here as a result of listening to those complaints, he indicated that he would not grant Mr. Engel's request to dismiss the case, but he did once again admonish Mr. Johnson, telling him that he would be running the risk, the possibility of some sanctions that might even include the idea of a dismissal, if he continued, as the judge had said, to engage in some form or any form of unprofessional conduct. Norman Samnick, once again, a, a, another flurry, if you would, between the attorneys. Now, obviously, these exchanges are taking place outside the presence of the jury, but the complaints that are being made by the lawyers are, focus on the idea that things are happening, they say in the courtroom, between the attorneys in the presence of the jurors. Uh, let me ask your impression, because I have varying thoughts about this. Sometimes I think attorneys think that the jurors pay more attention to us as the attorneys than they really do. Uh, what, what are your thoughts? Are, are jurors going to be affected, do you think, by those types of interactions between the attorneys in a case? Well, I think it, it, it all really all depends on the kind of case you have. If you have a, a case that is very technical, um, I think that uh, it is true that the attorney's actions, reactions, uh, stature mm -hmm. play a role in it. I think if a witness gives a sympathetic or a, a very articulate view of, of what had happened or what is being said or what is being done, I think that the, that the jurors will naturally focus towards what the witness said and what they did. Mm. I think if, a, if an attorney comes all apart, and mm. come, as, as you've just seen, uh, it looks like uh, Mr. Johnson is, is really crumbling here. Mm. Uh, I think that uh, that can be detrimental. But I, I would not want to suggest that uh, a case is won or lost strictly on uh, on how a jury feels about the about the attorney because mm -hmm. I think our our jurisprudence really tells us that we should base the case on the facts of the case or yeah. and what you believe are the facts yeah. but there's a tendency to be swayed by uh, yeah. uh, by a sympathetic attorney or, or one that's very arrogant, It'll, you know, the jury seems to go the other way. Uh, human dynamics being what they are, if a jury mm. doesn't like a lawyer, it might carry over to mm. the client. But I've been, I, been asked in, in matters where I've served as an arbitrator, as what do I think of the attorney? Do uh. I like him uh. or not? And I said, well, it has nothing to do with the, the facts of the case. Well, we just want to know, because really, it really is going to have a, yeah. uh, an, it really is going to become an issue, yeah, as well. you say, in human nature. That's right. All right, we're going to take a quick recess now from our tape coverage of this trial. We'll be taking you back into this courtroom in Los Angeles to continue our coverage. When we come back into this Los Angeles courtroom for the continued testimony in this trial, Patrick Moraz, the plaintiff, is still on the witness stand. He's still being cross-examined by defense attorney Don Engel.
And Sonny Engel has been focusing lately on uh, letters, or a number of letters actually, that were written either by Mr. Mraz or on his behalf. The defense contends that these letters show that Patrick Mraz was never, in fact, promised that he would be a full member of the Moody Blues. Let's go into the courtroom and watch as Don Engel continues with his cross-examination. On the second paragraph on page one, he says, with regard to the recording contract, as you know, Patrick, after all these years, still only receives a 17.5% share of royalties earned on the albums he has performed on. After all this time, it still seems that Patrick is regarded as the poor relation, mm -hmm. and we cannot see why, as a matter of principle, the remaining four band members cannot forego five-eighths of a percent each in respect of their personal share of recording royalties so that Patrick can reach a parity with the other members. And then he continues. I won't read the whole thing. It says a matter of principle bearing in mind the length of time he has now been with the band. And this is, of course, eight years after 1980. And we are bound to ask the question, will parity ever be reached? Now, did, did you have any conversations about Mr. Uh, with Mr. Moss, your accountant, in, in 1988 about this matter? Excuse me, this uh, phrase we can't read again. Um, when you said we cannot believe that this is a matter of hard cash, as far as the other um, Mr. Mraz, Mr. Mraz, uh, could you instruct Mr. Mraz not to read things that he wants to put Mr. in now? But this is his you attorney. Were asked, you were asked questions about specific parts of the document, yeah. and uh, respond to those questions, please, and do not volunteer information about other parts uh, of the letter. Right, Mr. Mraz, the question had nothing to do with the document. Now, listen to me, please. I asked you whether around this time you had conversations with Mr. Moss about this subject. I probably did, yes. And did you tell him that you had made an oral contract in 1980 pursuant to which you were entitled to 20% on all albums after the first album? He already knew it since that date, yes since that time. You told him that in 1980? Oh, yeah. And you told it to him many, many times after that? Yes. Do you see anything in this particular agreement that indicates that you had a contractual entitlement to 20 percent? Uh, is this an agreement? In this letter. In this letter. Oh. So what is, I don't understand your question. Do you, do you see anything in this letter that says Mr. Mraz is entitled to 20% on this album, regardless of whether he was in the group one year or 10 years, because he has an agreement to get the 20%? Is there anything like that in this letter? Um, is this a yes or no question? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. Well, if it can be answered in yes or no. <laughs> It, I'm sorry, it's really difficult to answer by yes or no. All right, I'll ask that. you an easier question. Do you see the word contract in this letter? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Do you see the word contract relating to a 1980 oral agreement? Mm, no. The only word contract in this letter relates to the next contract for the next album. Isn't that correct? That's correct, yes. But there's no word contract relating to 1980 in this letter. Isn't that correct? Um, as far as that is concerned, it's correct, but there's so many other letters before. And Thank you, sir. Okay. Have you seen a letter that was placed before you that refers to an oral contract in 1980 that says there was an oral contract in 1980? There was promises. Have you seen, have you seen promises or not contracts, Mr. Mm -hmm. Let's, at least in my language, and I'm not trying to decide the case, just listen to the question.
Lefty, have you seen a letter that I've shown you that talks about an oral contract in 1980? Not that you've shown me. Huh? Do you have in your possession a letter that says there was an oral contract in 1980 pursuant to which you were entitled to something? I probably have uh, written documentation about that, yes. Where is it? Well, it's, it's in, the, in, in all these uh, discoveries, you know. And it's all in... Well, why don't you... You had it overnight. Did you look for it? <laughs> you said you had it yesterday. Do you have it now? I could... Do you, ha do you have it now? Now? Yeah, right now. Can well, you f is it in the courtroom? Why don't you just pick it up and show it to me? <laughs> Can you do that? I might do that, yeah. Go ahead. Pick it up, show it to me. But this is a... a no, 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 Mr. Mraz, look. Yesterday you told me I was wrong. Today I'm asking you, show me the document. But the documents are here. And show, show it to me. Pick it up right now. Okay. Graham Edge, John Lodge, Justin Haywood, Ray Thomas, Patrick Mraz. Oral agreement. These are the parties to my contract. And Your to Honor, my agreement. Okay. I would like the remarks stricken and I would like the record to show. This is in the courtroom. Excuse me. I believe that the response is not responsive to the to the question. Oh. And the com also like, comments will comments will be stricken. I'd also like the record to show that Mr. Moraz stood up in the jury box with his glasses and pointed at each of my clients. Look. Now Mr. Moraz, do, do you know what a document is? Do you know what a document is? I know what a document is, yes. Tell me what, tell me what your definition of a document is. A document is, is a document. Did you show me a document when I asked you to show me a document? A document? Okay. Did I ask you to show, did I ask you three times today to show me a document? Did you hear me? Did you hear me say that? Yes or no? That's an easy yes or no. You were here. Did you hear me ask you to show me a document? When? Today? Tomorrow? Do you remember? Yesterday? You... 20 years ago? 10 years ago? Documents, declarations, agreements, contracts. We were playing music. The music is the document. It's a documentation. It's something which is recorded on vinyl or on CD or uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a courtroom, there is an agreement, there is a contract, there is a discussion which is documented. documented. Your Honor, could we have the remarks stricken? It's unresponsive to the question. document is... Wait, can you have to be heard on that? Yes. I think that a document constitutes a writing and that is a sufficient response to his answer. The question simply was, did he hear me say document to him? I didn't ask you to show me anything. I, I, the question on the record, Your Honor, was... I understand. The court, court will strike the response. Now, let me ask you a question again, Mr. Moraz. Do you remember that within the last 10 minutes, I have posed to you at least three questions stating, show me a document. Do you remember that? Yes, I remember. Now, have you shown me a document? Have you shown me a document? I, I showed you... Did you show me a document? Just yes or no? Well, did you show me a document? I cannot answer, you can't this, answer question, this question by yes or no, just like that. No. Right. Without further enlightenment from your part. Do you have a letter in your possession? from an attorney or yourself, which was sent to any member of the group, these four gentlemen, or their representative, that states in it that you had an oral agreement in 1980. Can you rephrase the question, please? Mr. Raz, let me ask you a different question. Do you think that if someone enters into an oral agreement in 1980, 
and 150 to 500 letters passed between his representatives and the representatives of the other side, would you expect that there would not be one mention in all of those documents during all of those disputes of the words oral contract in 1980? Objection calls for speculation. Do you have one document of that type that uses the words oral contract in 1980? I, Your Honor, it's argumentative, it's harassing, harassing. I would like ask to have a sidebar right now. The court will overrule the objection. I don't believe that this question has been, has been answered yet. Mr. Perez, do you understand the question, sir? I don't understand the question the way he's asking the question. No, I'm sorry. I'll go on to something else if he doesn't understand the question. At the moment, I feel uh, pressured, uh, harassed because you... Well, you I'll, I'll ask you. you some other questions. Looking at this document in front of you, I think we ought to. This might be a good time to take a brief recess, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> We're watching then Patrick Moraz becoming somewhat emotional during the course of his duel with defense attorney Don Engel, Judge Paul Boland indicating that it might be a good time for the court to take a recess. Good time for us to take a recess also. We'll be back in just a few moments. We'll take you back into this courtroom for the continuing testimony of Patrick Morass. So stay with us. And then to some of Patrick Moraz's music that he did without the Moody Blues. The trial continues, and we take you now into the courtroom as Patrick Moraz is still on the witness stand, still being cross-examined by defense attorney Don Engel. The focus of a series of questions here by defense attorney Engels here on comments made by Patrick Moraz as part of an interview he gave to Keyboard Magazine in 1991. In that interview, he mentions, he talks about his years with the Moody Blues and indicates that he feels that the band was getting somewhat stagnant at the time. Obviously, the defense attorney is going to be focusing on these comments. Let's go back in the courtroom and watch. It says here, clearly, this restless 43-year-old is beginning to find the nostalgic framework of that band, referring to the Moody Blues, too confining. Is that an accurate statement? Well, I can't see the... the in, in this I'm, I'm confused because he's saying that is that accurate the way it's written? Is that accurate as to what the person who wrote it thought? Or is it accurate as to what Patrick Moraz thought? We're going to lose money. You remember you testified that? Yes. Now let's go on to page five or six or whatever. And let the jury take over. I'm not going to ask a question on this, but there's not that many pages. Let's just put it up so we have an idea what's going on. And if you'll excuse me just the time pressure, I'm going to take that down. Put, pull it down and we'll have to let him read it some other Let's go up to the next page. There's still a couple pages. Next page. No, not that one. That, that's out of order. That's the last page. The last page comes first. It's out of order. Now, here's a page that says, in the big paragraph in the middle, 
is, that was obviously a typographical error you made. We're going to take a break for just a few moments. When we come back, we'll bring you back into this courtroom as Don Engel continues to question Patrick Moraz about a number of documents, including letters he himself had sent to the other members of the Moody Blues Band. We're back in just a few moments, so stay with us. Do your kids like to read? Nichols like to read? No. My kids hate to read. Unless it's a toy catalog. Now, here's a page that says, in the big paragraph in the middle, is, that was obviously a typographical letter you made, it has to be understood and forwarded that, although certain payments have already been made to Main Horse Establishment for the services of Patrick Moraz. None of the music and sounds so far already recorded in the context of the new album by Patrick Moraz are usable for release in the context of the said album until a satisfactory agreement has been reached. All rights remain reserved at this stage. Is that correct? Yes. Thomas have at their disposition to pay Main Horse Establishment for the services of Patrick Moraz. Did you write that? Yes. It has been written like that, yes. And below... There's a number 501,150. And you wrote, quote, bring that up so we can see it. Steady. Quote, more than half a million U.S. dollars to be shared between the four actual members of the Moody Blues. Justin, yeah. Hay Justin Hayward, John Lodge, Graham Edge, and Ray Thomas out of which amount they will have to pay their own company threshold. Did you write that? Yes. Now, on the next page, at the very top, it says, Main Horse Establishment has been paid so far for 23 days at $800 a day. Right. The main horse establishment, that's that company in Liechtenstein that you were talking about, correct? Yes. And that was for work that you did on the current album, is that correct? Yes. What album was that? Was uh, that it was called The Other Side of Life. Thank you. Now, on the next page, I call your attention to the bottom, very bottom paragraph. <laughs> and it says... Although having been with the band for well over seven years, mm -hmm. and having been asked to be equal sharing in the touring expenses and proceeds, Patrick Moraz is still treated as a non-equal member in all respects. Was that correct? At that point it was, yeah, that's what I felt, yeah. Uh -huh. And you remember you also testified that when the band came to you and said, we want you to be treated as an equal member on the touring, it was because they felt that was the only economical way to do it, otherwise they were... Six, including the Moody Blues. Have you ever written a hit album? Um, if I... Yes, of course. I have written a, a hit album, yes. Then why did you answer that question with one word at your deposition? No. <laughs> ah, because I was referring to the artistic content of the album, not the marketing aspect of it. So you led us to believe that we could come into court and rely on your testimony, and we asked you, did you ever read, hit it, write a hit album? You said no. And we were supposed to figure out that you were referring to something different than we were referring to. Is that no, your judgment? It calls for speculation. Hang on. I don't think it's important what counsel is. It's very important. Ob Just a minute. Objections overruled. Go ahead. Can, you, can you answer that yes or no? Oh, I can't answer that yes or no. Right. But I can that's tell fine. You. That's fine. <coughs> However, I'd like that, to... That's, that's okay. fine. Mr. Raz, would you like to have a dictionary while I'm questioning you so we could look up each of these words? Honestly, would you want to have a dictionary? Oh, I'm fine like that. Pardon? I'm fine like that. Thank you very much. Yet... I, I don't I, need a dictionary. Well, the problem, Mr. Mraz, is... What, what are we going to... Let's go on to the next question. I'm afraid of it. Your Honor, of course, yes, disregard that comment, ladies and gentlemen. Well, Your Honor, may I? May I I'll let's ask go on. Let's okay. go on and uh, ask questions and have answers. Okay. <clears throat> Is it true, Mr. Moraz, 
that at no time were you ever accepted as an equal member of the Moody Blues during your relationship with them? That is true. We're watching again the cross-examination by defense attorney Don Engel of the plaintiff here, Patrick Moraz. That wrapped up basically the seventh day of the trial in this matter. The eighth day began much as, as we showed you the beginning of the seventh day here with the attorneys once again at each other and Judge Paul Bowen once again having to... That's correct. So it was your position at that time, until you had a written contract for this album, even though they had paid you for the 23 days, they could not use your material. Is that correct? Was that That's necessary? correct. Okay. Now let's go on to that last page. Now you notice at the bottom... But that's not the last page. The last page was the one we read before. Well, this page says conclusion. No, I'm um, sorry, sir. Well, I'm well, sorry. No, it's, it's, uh, yeah. It is apparently misplaced in, in the it, various binders. It says conclusion. The next line says in view of the circumstances. You have it, you have it there, Mr. Moyes. You see it? Yes, I, I've seen that's it. Fine. That's fine. That's the one that we're talking about. It's the correct way because if you look at the page before, you'll see the sentence continue. I wrote the letter, remember? Well, your sentence continued on the next page. Believe me, it's the correct way. The conclusion was at the end. At the bottom of the page with the conclusion, you wrote, as for the so-called imbalance having arisen by reason of poor sales of the present. You see that? It may be out of order in the book, but just look at the conclusion page. All that we're talking, Mr. Franz, all we're talking about, don't worry about the proper order of the pages. Let's just focus upon the page that yes, okay. reads conclusion at the very top. You say that the imbalance on the present can't and won't be taken into consideration due to the fact that neither the four members nor the producer of the present have taken my various comments into consideration and even refused to listen to some of the tracks I had been preparing for that particular album. So you were disturbed because none of your tracks were on that album, is that correct? Oh, uh, no, I was talking about the present album. On the present album, right. The previous album. Oh, yeah. You were disturbed about it. Yes, I was disturbed, yeah. yes. And the album didn't do well, and the Moody Blues said to you, look, you, you made more money than we did because we haven't earned any money on that album. And you yes. refused to make an adjustment, isn't that correct? That's right. <clears throat> then you went up further. You said, probably the record company, having not promoted the album as well as they should, is a major reason for the failure of that album. I can't be penalized for such third-party negligence. Now, you contend you were a full member of the Moody Blues at this time. Uh, did you think the Moody Blues was supposed to be penalized for the negligence of the record company, but you shouldn't? Um, I've never referred to the Moody Blues there. I referred to, uh, uh, to me. I, I said I can't be penalized for third-party negligence. Nothing to do there. I, I, I didn't mention them, so the, the question didn't arise then. It didn't arise? Well, you knew that if the record company didn't sell records, the Moody Blues weren't getting any royalties either. Did yeah, well, they wrote the music, and I proposed to write some before. You know. I see. If you wrote it, it would have done better, even if the record I'm sure company it didn't it would have done much better, because as a group, we could have worked as a unit and really uh, developed our forces where the sum of the parts are greater than the parts. You've had about six or seven groups that you work with, haven't you? No, I've had uh, a couple of groups under my own name, and then I've had um, I've been invited to join uh, another band before Yes called Refugee. Then I went to Yes, and then the Moody Blues. What do you mean you were invited to join Refugee? You were in Refugee, weren't you? I was in Refugee. That was That's there. what I said. Yeah, I was invited to form Refugee. I'm not interested in whether you're invited. Why don't you answer the question? I, was I counted when you were testifying. I, I, I was invited to form Refugee with the two ex-members of right. the night. How many bands were you in? Um, counting my own bands? Yes. I've been into the Patrick Murray. Just how many? How many? How One, many? two, three, five, 